Well, here I am at Canterbury West. I'm at the start of another two day, 200 pound odyssey to Manchester to uh, report on the nice PHAC B committee, Public Health Advisory Committee B. As I've said in the previous podcast, something interesting always happens, always happens, guaranteed on these uh, on these trips. So uh, I'm at Canterbury West Station. It's Thursday. I'm going to get the 11:26. I think I'm not expected to be in Manchester. It's not bad actually. 35 pound to get up to Manchester is pretty good. But then it is like absolutely off peak. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it. I've got everything's charged up, you know, like as you do. Get everything charged up to the 100% on the batteries, including hopefully the camera. I'm not going to do too much, um, too many pictures of trains on this trip because the last time I went up to Birmingham to watch the ASPD, it was all there's a train coming in, there's a train going, there's a train coming in. People thought it was a train spotting video, which it was a bit. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm going to just do a little bit less of the uh, the journey and um, a bit bit more, uh, perhaps a bit more commentary. So I'm just looking up. You can't resist looking up the platform, can you? When you're waiting at a station, the uh, it's just natural to look. And when you're at a bus stop, you just look up the road, don't you? To see if there's a bus. You can't. I can't stop myself doing it. I don't like travelling by train. It's too time sensitive. You miss the train by two minutes and. Uh, that's it. They're, they're very unforgiving, especially on these cheap advanced saver tickets. If you, you miss the train that you're supposed to be on, then that's it. They won't. You, you can die on the streets of wherever you are, as far as the railway's concerned. <laughs> and they won't let you go on earlier on earlier um, trains either. Like at least the air, air airlines like EasyJet now. If you turn up early, or or then the ferries have always done this. I don't understand it. It, it helps them load balance if they let you go early if you've turned up early but not the trains oh no not British Rail anyway this is it Canterbury West start of the journey um, I'll um, see you later on Houston station, I hope you can hear me. It's a bit noisy. Um, normally, I wouldn't be talking to you about now, but remember I said that these things are weird and sort of the weirdness has already started. I've had a, I got an email, not today, I think it was yesterday, from someone at NICE. And obviously it's a NICE meeting I'm going to attend tomorrow. And uh, I'm registered for it. They insist that you register for it and then they confirm that you're registered and then you have to send an email to say that you're definitely going. So I've done all that. So they know I'm going. Anyway, I got this email from a guy called um, Peter somebody. Anyway, not important. Uh, but the main thing is he said to me, you know, do you want to meet up? He says, I see you're going to a nice meeting on Friday. And uh, I sort of worked out that you'll probably be going through Kings Cross Euston on... Thursday afternoon evening and um, and I'd really like to meet you. He's from their PR department, you see. So, uh, you know, to talk about any concerns that you might have or uh, you know, just to have a chat. And, uh, and now, if you're uh, taking a train on a reasonably long journey, which from Canterbury to Manchester is quite a long journey and there's a connection in London. Now, the last thing you want to do really in the middle of your connection is schedule a business meeting, isn't it? So I'm thinking, mm, yeah. actually, what I was thinking was, this this is a bit spooky, you know, because this guy, I mean, I know when you put stuff on YouTube, okay, you are putting yourself out there a bit, you know, you're in the public domain, aren't you, really? And so, um, and even if you take a photo and post a photo, if it's geotagged, people will know where you, were when you took it and if you took it at home then they they know where you live and people can scrape an awful lot of stuff off the social this just took me back a bit it was like you know it was like almost like an i know where you live type video saying you know i i've i've worked out you're going to be going through london tomorrow and i'd like to meet up 
So I'm like, well, you know, I've got the time to do it. I have got the time to do it, as long as it's only like a short meeting over a coffee or something. So I said, yeah, because I was sort of curious, you know, what he wanted. And it was a nice email, you know, it's just like, you know, I was, you've obviously got some concerns and I would like to have a chat with you about them. Now, um, <laughs> he, he didn't really, you know, we, he didn't say there was an agenda uh, and, and on the face of it, it's just a chat over a coffee. But it, obviously it's unusual to be contacted by the one of the associate directors or something or the head of the PR department at NICE. And I'm, of course it's over the fact that I'm posting stuff on YouTube. Um, and it's going to go one of it's going to go one of two ways, isn't it? I mean, let's face it. It's going to be either he's going to say, you know, great to see sort of citizen reporting, and uh, you know, it's it, it's wonderful for us to get all this feedback very directly about how um, we're handling things, and we'll, we're going to take everything on board. And if you want to ring me, uh, this is my direct line, and, and that it could go that way, right? Or it could go another way. It could be like, um, you know, uh, where well, it's great what you're doing, but you are mentioning people by name and uh, you're calling it a nice committee when technically we'd like to say it's an independent committee, really, although it is going to recommend, make recommendations of nice. So it might be in the past, and I'm going on uh, nice. I'm going on how the Department of Health handles things like this. The Department of Health, if their comms department rings you, it's because they want to threaten you, basically, <laughs> indirectly. They want to say you're doing a great job, but we'd rather you didn't do it, you know, or we, you know, if you carry on doing it this way, we're going to have to think about how we're going to respond to that or, or whatever, or write to your editor or make a complaint to the GDC or something. And so because of the, the, the fact that the Department of Health actively tries to chill the press and the freedom of reporting and things like that, and they don't like uh, openness and transparency. I'm just sort of uh, tarring the nice with the same brush, which I shouldn't do really. But it's a bit, you know. I mean, he's like, <laughs> and he's very keen to meet me, you know. Like he's like, well, I, I know, I see you're you're coming, and he knows because he knows I'm going to the meeting tomorrow because he's checked and probably seen that I'm registered for it. Uh, and of course, when you register, you have to give your address and. So he's like, well, I'll meet you at King's Cross. And I'm like, well, and he's like, well, but don't worry, you know, if we can't meet at King's Cross, then uh, we could meet at Euston. And I'm like, well, well, but he's like, you know, or perhaps we could walk across from King's Cross to Euston together. Or if that's not convenient, then don't worry, because uh, there's a, like a Pret de Manger at Euston, and perhaps we could meet there. And, you know, we could make it at 12.10, but don't worry if you're late, we could make it 12.20, or we could make it another day. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me glad I'm a man because if I was a woman and I got an email like that I would probably report him to the police for stalking he's probably a lovely bloke I'm just about to go and have a chat with him and I'm sure he's going to watch this so hopefully he'll get a laugh out of this as well and for all I know he's around the corner talking to another camera but uh, it's going to be uh, it's, it's weird, the weirdness has started the weirdness has started, ok and then the, another bit of the weirdness is that normally when you meet someone you don't know, you, you sort of, how are you going to recognise me, you know? Uh, he's going to carry the financial times and I'll, I'm going to have a pink carnation. But in fact, he doesn't need that because he knows what I look like. He's seen me. He's, he's, the fact that he's been sitting at his desk on the internet watching me on video is just a little bit weird, you know? It's just, I know that's how it works, I know that, but... It makes it's just the you know, the hairs on the back of my neck are just gone up a bit, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's what you do. You stuff put stuff on YouTube. It doesn't matter what who anyone can watch you, can't you? Some the Queen to a pedophile can be watching you. That's just it's just part for the. So I'm going to go round to where we we uh, said we were going to meet because I haven't got too long because I do have a connection to make, and um, I'm just going to hang around see who picks me up. <laughs> He's gonna. If this is as weird as it gets, then I can cope with it. If he's as nice as he sounds, then I'll be able to cope with him. If he's, if he's a little bit, if it's anything more weird than that, then I won't be surprised because it always is. Anyway, I'll let you know how we get on. You know, subject to the normal standards in terms of, um, you know, I, I would imagine because he's he's come to talk about, he, he's expecting me to blog about this, he's expecting me to, you know, because I think that's why he's asked to talk to me, because 
not that my 70 viewers or something on YouTube is really going to affect nice, you know. I mean, I, if I had 70,000 people watching these videos, then they might be different. But 70, you know, and probably 20 of those are me and 20 of those are, are nice. So let's say 30, okay. <laughs> oh, God, my life is weird. It is weird life. Right, I'll talk to you later. I'm in the Mercure Hotel, um, which is a, a step up from that scumbag hotel I stayed in last time. It's nice. Uh, it's uh, cheaper if you book in advance, which I'll come back to later. It's about £84 a night, which is, I think is pretty good. I mean, it is, it's pretty comfortable here. I'm on the 12th floor. Actually, before I talk about the 12th floor, my meeting with the guy from Nice, I said it was going to go one of two ways. Either he was gonna he's gonna have a an agenda, or it'll be just a, like a touch base, nice to meet you type thing. So, just while I'm talking about that, just think which you think it is, because I, like, I always like to do a little quiz for these things. It's an A or B. Do you think he was a completely nice, or B whether he had a, an agenda? Anyway, <clears throat> so while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you why I don't like staying on the twelfth floor because nobody involved in any sort of contingency planning, serious contingency planning, ever stays above the fourth floor in a hotel. And the reason for that is, you're, if a fire breaks out in a hotel, a serious fire, one that you might need to get rescued from, the, the fire brigade's not really going to have much chance over the... their ladders are not long enough to get up here. Believe me, even if they could get a ladder up to this window, I wouldn't get on it. So, <clears throat> anyone who knows anything about anything that goes wrong with hotels, tends to stay on the fourth floor or below. Now, someone's very persistently knocking on the door or I've got hammering in the water, um, which is nasty, but although you can get antibiotics for it. Um, so, uh, so I'm always a bit nervous about staying up this high, but uh, what I'm going to do is have a quick look on my compass in a minute and see if I'm east facing because I might be able to get the um, decent view of the meteorite out of the, 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 the comet out of the window in the morning if I'm east facing and it's cloudless sky. So what did you think? Do you think he was nice or nasty? Hey, nice or nasty? Well, he had a little bit of an agenda and it, it wasn't uh, anything serious and it wasn't uh, uh, done in a nasty way but he wanted to talk to me because we named one of the nice uh, secretariat in the last video and attributed certain actions to her. And like most civil servants, I think that she felt that she would have preferred to have remained anonymous and not had us comment on her role in the meeting on the grounds that she's a facilitator and uh, was only um, really um, uh, trying to sort of further the work of the committee. Now, now the, the things that we mentioned that she did, and I won't dwell on it because apparently she's a little bit miffed, and, and we do... Fine, this is not the first time we've come across this. I mean, public servants, civil servants, anyone who's paid out of public money, who's used to operating in an environment of total support and secrecy and uh, um, uh, without any sort of outside scrutiny other than their immediate line manager, it, it comes as a big shock when they realise that um, when they're in a public meeting that their, their actions are open to public scrutiny. So um, I can fully understand why anyone might not wish to be named or commented on in, in any sort of public meeting. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. And the reason why it wasn't the way it worked in, in that case last time was that um, the person concerned had offered to do some work for the committee. Now, as this guy, the guy from NICE said today, that is what the secretariat are, there for, are for. They're there to facilitate and to you know, possibly even to prepare papers to bring back to the committee. Um, however, uh, I I did make the point to him, which I think found its uh, target, which was that if he and I were ever to have a legal agreement, I would prefer to be the one that drew it up. And that's, that's a subtle argument, but uh, especially in the context of what we're talking about, because this is not even the, really the main issue. I mean, the main issue is all about oral health. But 
there, there is a subtext of transparency and openness going on and, and, and freedom of re reporting and things like that. So our, my attitude really was that when the um, staff get to the point of doing the work of the committee, then they, they become effectively part of the committee and therefore they're open to scrutiny. And the person in question, I believe, had um, uh, drawn up a table which um, presented the evidence in a certain way because she felt that the committee um, weren't um, able to consider it in the way that it had been presented and um, also undertook to, when, when the committee were unable to make any recommendations last time, if you remember, having been prompted several times and had the bar lowered several times in terms of what the Secretariat would accept, um, promised to go away and come back with, with some suggestions that they could call their own. Now, that, as far as I'm concerned, that's a little bit too far over the line for us not to mention it. Because if the story is that the committee is deadlocked, and if the story is that the committee is unable to reach a decision or can't make any recommendations, then that that should be the story. They shouldn't, the Secretariat shouldn't say to themselves, this committee is, is deadlocked. It's up to us to do their work for them. We, you know, we're going to have to unconstipate them um, because that is effectively participating in the work of the committee. They, they, the committee should unconstipate itself, um, and I can understand their frustration if the committees, you know, especially if they've sat on many, many of these committees and and uh, seen seen them wind themselves in knots. And this one's winding itself in more knots than normal. So. Um, we, you know, I, we we have no desire to upset anybody. So we're, I'm sorry that that person was upset. But having thought about it, and and uh, I haven't had a chance to review the video, but I'm pretty certain I know what was said. Um, I'll be interested tomorrow to see whether or not the the secretariat still play a large role in the um, the decision making process. In so far as they part, not that they're making decisions, but. As I say, you know, if you and I have a legal contract, I'd like to draw it up. Not no reason why it shouldn't be the same as the one that you draw up, but I'd just like to do it. And it's that very subtle um, influence on the working of committees that uh, we we are looking out for, and uh, we will bring to people's attention. Now, um, weirdness, further weirdness. Uh, got an email today on my way I think after I arrived here uh, dated uh, today dated uh, 5 20 p.m. saying that uh, a further meeting of the committee has been scheduled please be aware that an additional meeting is scheduled on Tuesday the 3rd of December now um, bearing in mind I am talking to you on Thursday November 28th you'll realize that this is in five days time it's actually probably in four days time now um, and it says that uh, a registration for members of the public has been on the NICE website since Monday the 18th of November and closed today. However, um, and this has got shades of hitchhikers all over it because, you know, it's this extra meeting. They've, they've written to all the members, they've got, they've got all the members' consent and got them all to reschedule their diaries and got them all organised to the extent that they can now say that they've got a meeting next Tuesday at short notice which I think in itself is a reflection of the um, the fact that the committee is underperforming, you know, they're not, they're, they're struggling with this, they are not making decisions, they're going to need some more time to achieve the objective that NICE has given them. And so they've had to schedule an extra meeting, which this close to Christmas is kind of a bit tricky, and yet they've done it, and they've managed to get a date, and they must have known what the date was when they put it on the website on the 18th of November. And um, they've, there's been a 10-day window to register, and they've actually realised that nobody would have... Because that extra meeting was not even suggested at the last meeting, and, and only the committee members would have been told about it, then nobody would have thought to have looked at the website to see if an extra meeting had been scheduled. So there's been a 10-day window to register that really nobody knew about, and which is now closed. Um, however, they are keeping the registration open now because they, they, they do, I think they do realise that they should have emailed the observers um, to tell them about this extra meeting. And, and, what, and, and telling us that with four days' notice obviously means 
it's going to be very difficult to get to this meeting. Very difficult. I mean, and I'm, you know, hotel rooms, you, you could, I think, get a 30% discount on hotel rooms if you book 30 days in advance. Now, booking a hotel room in December in Manchester with four days' notice is, it's going to be doable, but it's going to be far more expensive than it would have been if we'd known about this. And it's the same with the trains. Obviously, the closer to the date of travel, the more you pay. So they're, they're um, you know, failure to consider the observers and send us an email uh, in a timely fashion uh, probably cost me personally £50, cost the association £50. And they're all like, oh, very sorry, sort of thing, but um, sorry for any incoming it's caused, but no offer to um, reimburse us for any extra expense incurred as a result. Not, not, not least, of course, is in another day spent in um, travelling up and down and, and wandering around Manchester City Centre on my own because um, because they can't keep to their schedule because they can't, you know, and they've got enough meetings for goodness sake to do this I mean they, they just can't and we don't even know wh whether if they have this extra one they might need, need some more extra ones as well I know if I wouldn't be complaining about this if I lived in Manchester but I don't, I live in Canterbury so it's a problem so so there we go. So we've got uh, weirdness in the meeting and weirdness of an extra meeting being booked at short notice and us not being told until after the closing date to register and then um, then it being in four days' time. So I've now got to go home for the weekend and then, and then come back again. I don't know why they could not have just booked two days together. Why did they have to book a, a Friday and a Tuesday? I mean, is it not... Could they not book a Thursday and a Friday, or a Tuesday and a Wednesday, or something? You know, did they have to make them? Did they have to put a weekend in between? I, I suppose they did. I don't know why. They, they, they don't. You know, how nice works. How they work is beyond me. I don't know what sort of intelligence is in charge. But anyway, I'm not going to complain about them too much because the chat today was very charming and. Uh, uh, and I've, uh, he said if I ever have any problems then to give him a ring but I, the trouble is the problems I'm having with him I don't think I'm capable of rectification by him and he's not going to refund my travel problems uh, although he did promise to have another look at the fact that all we can take in is a pencil and paper um, and I said to him that uh, you know we've had trouble getting permission to have a desk so we're all writing on our knees and uh, he looked at me as if I was mad you know he, he looked at me as if he couldn't believe that. And I can believe it because, you know, for two or three meetings I've had to come along and just balance um, my briefcase on my lap and the the pad and the pencil goes on and I write on top of the briefcase on my knees. So I really don't know, I don't know whether they really know what's going on, you know. I think think the the, the top and the, the the bottom needs to. I mean, they, they need to do that program on the telly where they um, go around the shop floor. You know, someone needs to. Someone at the top from Nice needs to go along to some of these meetings as a public observer and and uh, and see uh, what the situation is. Anyway, that's it. So it's Thursday evening. They've got a nice Christmas fair outside. So I've had a. I haven't had a glass of blue wine. But uh, I've had a little wander around and look, it's all very jolly down there. The um, the old uh, drug addicts are looking very festive in the coloured lights. So um, I'm going now. I'm in the hotel now. So um, a nice early start tomorrow, and uh, I'll talk to you on the way home. Hope it all goes well. No more weirdness. Fingers crossed. Welcome to a very wet and. Uh, dark Manchester. It's uh, getting darker earlier now. I've turned the camera around because uh, as you know walking along looking to a camera lens is not that clever when you're in this sort of traffic but um, also because I just can't seem to get this camera to point at me. I've had a quick look at the footage and half of it is of my chin and the half that's not of my chin is of my forehead so it's uh, just I've got to get a different camera I need I can't see the screen that's the trouble I need one with the screen that faces forward so I can see what I'm filming at the moment I seem to be doing most of the filming is just what's 
it's just looking out my nose. So, I don't know, if I'll have a quick look and see if the footage is too bad to be made into a video. If it is, then I'll just make this into an audio podcast. But uh, anyway, this is Manchester in December. It's uh, raining. That's the building where we're doing the, uh, the, the meeting. It was, um, I'm not going to do a debriefing on the meeting because it was, I think it was a little bit more complicated than the others and, uh, you know, they're starting to list uh, things specifically and uh, say, yeah, you there, that's in, that's out. So I'm going to, when I get a chance to sit down and just uh, draw out of my notes what's in favour and what isn't, I'll be able to give you a much better debriefing. But, um, I mean, things like uh, fluoridated milk, uh, unfortunately, much to the chagrin of the Borrow Foundation, is is pretty definitely out. Whereas uh, things like uh, uh, painting fluoride varnish on teeth, which we always, you know, which the, the Secretariat in particular has pushed pretty hard for, is pretty much guaranteed to be in. Um, supervised brushing in primary schools, probably in. Um, supervised brushing in secondary schools, as proposed by a fairly senior member of the dental profession, who should have known better. Uh, I think, and we're certainly out. Don't know how I would have taken to being <laughs> supervised brushing my teeth at my secondary school twice a day with us in assembly. So they're going into the nitty gritty now. So uh, they've got another meeting. They've done naught to five. They've done uh, five to 18. They've done adults, which is sort of, they've lumped them all together, five to uh, 19 to 66, uh, retirement age, whatever it is gonna be. Um, and they've, they haven't done the elderly. Still lots of confusion. It's still a massive attempt to micromanage the profession. And uh, they're still coming out with absolute gems. Like uh, one of the academics said that uh, he didn't think fluoride mouth rinse was a good idea because uh, it ha has got alcohol in it and uh, therefore it wouldn't be appropriate to have a mass program of rinsing with fluoride mouth rinse for children because children shouldn't be encouraged to use alcoholic mouth rinses or, or certain ethnic groups and we those of us there are a couple of manufacturers in the audience and a couple of dentists and we all looked at each other and said what what alcohol in fluoride mouth rinse i don't think so so you know but then if if he'd been a dentist he would have known that i don't know where he got i think he's getting mouthwash mixed up with uh, mouth rinse <sighs> and there's all sorts of other things like they were talking about uh, the, the uh, fact that fizzy drinks can still damage your teeth because of the carbonic acid, even though they may be low sugar. And uh, said, uh, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm not allowed to quote names. Somebody, somebody on the committee said, uh, if they can't drink fizzy drinks. Perhaps they should be encouraged to drink fruit juice. So again, the dentist would have known straight away that the citric acid in fruit juice is every bit as bad, if not worse sometimes, than the carbonic acid in uh, carbonated drinks. Or, or for that uh, matter, the acetic acid that's in vinegar when it's drunk as a sort of a vinegar and cider honey type drinks so you know we all sit there and quietly despair those of us that are watching but it's uh, I don't know it went quite quickly today so the meeting again Tuesday I can't come 
I can't honestly. I don't have the energy to drag myself up to the northern extremities of the British Empire twice in two weeks. So I'm going to let them do the elderly and then we'll get back to uh, yeah. I do like big cities in the in the around Christmas. They're all very nice with all the lights on. Oops. That's what I need, a bicycle. Alright, so if I can think of anything else, I'll uh, I'll let you know. Otherwise I'm gonna write this up for uh, Fusion magazine. And also probably put the salient bits in um, the December leader for dental practice. So if you're not a Fusion member, join. Why not? And uh, if you are, but if you're not a Fusion member, then grab dental practice and have a look on uh, on page three. All right. I'll, uh, I'll possibly I'll talk to you later.